Kia internet. Hello and welcome. To the latest Sky Bear Games podcast. Episode 13. And we had something special prepared. I say had, but because we've been busy, we are pushing that one back. So next fortnight, you're going to hear us talking about some of my tips for being a game master. Cool. I've got lots of experience, so uh, hopefully I should be able to pull out a couple of good things. But for this week, we found ourselves busy. Once again, is there a different sort of way to be? (laughs) (laughs) And so we've decided to go for a topic that we can do a little bit faster and a little bit more easily. What's the topic, James? The topic is Dragonlance. Oh! Oh, boy. (laughs) What fun! Just how excited we are. So (laughs) No, I am. I'm low-key excited. Dragonlance was one of the original Dungeons and Dragons settings. After uh, Mistara and Greyhawk, which just sort of happened. They were just sort of the home settings where they took a lot of stuff that had been written already and just tied it all together and said, okay, this is a world now. Whereas Dragonlance was the first Dungeons and Dragons setting, which was designed top down, we are making a world. So in 1984, Tracy Hickman had just lost his job. And he had submitted a few adventures to TSR already as a freelancer. And they said, yeah, we'd be interested in hearing more of your work. Why don't you drive up from Utah to Michigan to come talk to us in person? So he and his wife loaded everything up into their car and drove from Utah to Lake Michigan. And on the way, they brainstormed some ideas that they could present to the publishers, to TSR. So just just from just to backtrack for me, it's yep. Tracy Hickman, the guy who did Ravenloft. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Uh, and he did a couple of other things as well. Ravenloft is the big one. Ravenloft is and his wife people. too, right? And his like, wife she's too. She's part yeah. of this too. Yeah. yeah. Um. So she doesn't actually get enough credit. Nearly right, enough credit. Right. Oh, uh, fancy. That. Laura Hickman. Right. But yeah, the whole trip up, uh, they shot ideas back and forth. And one of the things that they decided was that even though the game was called Dungeons and Dragons, there were lots and lots and lots of dungeons, Dungeons, but there weren't very many dragons. And when they showed up, you tended to just go, oh, look, a dragon and punch it. And that was about it. But the game was more famous at that point for its adventures about giants and uh, floating skulls with a lot of gems in them. I'm now starting to see why Dragons of Tyrenia is so inspired by Dragonlance. Yeah. I didn't quite get that it had that sort of history to it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Dragons of Tyrenia is 100% my love letter to Dragonlance. Because it was the first place where they really took the time to detail the lives of the dragons. Yeah. The um, the motivations. And make them really yeah. central. The other thing that he was interested in... So he had already done Ravenloft, where we had a villain, we had the location that was tied to the villain, and the villain had goals. Mm, mm, mm. But ultimately, Ravenloft was still, go to the dungeon and kill everything in it. Tracy Hickman wondered, was it possible to tell a real story Mm, in a mm. role-playing game? Cool, Cool. Was it possible to tell the sort of story, not just like a story, but like a big epic story could you design an entire world specifically to tell a story right so he took it to tsr and tsr agreed that they didn't have enough dragons and they liked him and they liked the stuff he'd done ravenloft was a smash success so yeah and they said you know what there are 12 different dragons in the monster manual so you can write a 12 adventure series Mm. and each one can be focused around a different dragon type and we will build this massive world, we'll do this huge project. And he worked with a lot of the other people in the office, and they all put in their own different things into it. So uh, one of the other guys at the office said, oh, I've got my homebrew gods. I think they'd be a really good mix. And he picked them. There's seven good gods, seven neutral gods, seven evil gods. I actually really like the Pantheon for Dragon Lance. It's very yeah. nice and tight and unified and then they also have this idea that every culture has the same gods but they believe different things about them and they've got different names and they've got different relationships depending on who's worshipping them. I like how they're tied into the moons and the magic. And the constellations. Mm. So, oh yeah, hey, Dragonlance's constellations are really important because the constellations are literally the gods and the moons are literally the gods of magic 
and uh, there's three moons, and oh my god, how much did I steal? I didn't even realise how much I'd been stealing. Well, you didn't steal the constellation stuff, because that was quite a lot of my influence. Yeah. I wanted to put a lot of Zodiac stuff into this. The three moons was just me wanting more than one to make it be a little bit fantastic. And wanting a prime number. And wanting a prime number, and then three is just a lot. Five is too many, two's not enough. Three moons, nice amount. Yeah. So, 12 dragons, you say. So, in 5th edition's book, we've got 10 dragons, 5 colour and 5 chromatic and and 5 metallic. Which uh, two are we missing in 5th edition? The two that we're missing that we had in the original Monster Manual are the Platinum Dragon, Mm. aka Bahamut, the god of good dragons, and... Tiamat. Awesome. The five-headed god of evil dragons. Mm. They had stats. There were more sort of gods and uh, archdevils in the original Monster Manual, and they were in there. So they were the bonus two. No wonder uh, satanic panic people thought (laughs) D&D was... uh... Well, dragons are associated with the devil and yeah but also too. you know they had a whole like demon nomicon of oh naming, yeah, 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 yeah naming yeah. demons and devils and yeah yep absolutely it's a great book <laughs> oh no anybody who's gotten their hands on the original monster manual it's a really uh, yeah it, it's an inspiration for all players that was my first monster manual that i got i got in a secondhand bookshop and I spent a lot of time just flicking through and just going, wow, what's this thing? What's this thing? And having no idea what all the numbers meant. Right, right. Yeah. I still have no idea what the older numbers mean. Maybe we should do a read through of it at some point and you can laugh at all the old art because it's really terrible. I think I've seen stands. it. I think I've anyway, seen it. Anyway, so Tracy Hickman used a lot of inspirations. Like I said, he pulled in stuff from some of the other uh, people at TSR to help build the world. Different people contributed different things. They helped to do playtest for the adventure, that play just wound up being really super important. I'll get back to that in a second. Okay. And his other main inspirations were obviously The Lord of the Rings, but also Mormonism. Oh, wow. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, because I can see that. Tracy Hickman was a Mormon, and he went on his Mormon... Um, What's it? Uh, pilgrimage isn't the right word. Oh, where, yeah. they, where they have to go on their mission. Yeah, the mission. Yeah, he went on his mission to Indonesia. Which is why mm. all the spell casting in Dragonlance is done in like fake Indonesian. Huh. I d- n- Bonus I fun fact. I never fact. picked that. I never picked yeah. that from what I've read. Anyway, TSR decided this was a really big deal, and this became the first big multimedia project that they decided to do. They decided they were going to go full hog on this. There was there going are to be so many computer games. The computer games came a little bit later. Yeah, yeah. Um, so actually, the first ones were adaptations of the novels. Mm, and mm. Not Oh, well, the novels. Because <laughs> the novels were the big thing. Mm, the no- mm. They decided to do They were bigger than the games, modules. right? They decided to do tie-in novels. I'll talk about the novels more in a minute. Because, <laughs> yeah, they were so much bigger than the game. They decided to do a uh, calendars, miniatures... Computer games. Were miniatures big before then? Or? Yeah. Um, okay. Rel Partha had a license to do little pewter miniatures. And so they had a couple of boxes where you could get the different monsters and dragons and proper heroes actual, and stuff. Like, yeah, weighty proper, miniatures. like, weighty miniatures. Nice. There were a whole ton of them back in the day. Um, if we do some shopping around, we could get you an old school Strad. Because I know what you want, Claire. I'm tempted. <laughs> I'm very tempted. Yeah, and you had to paint them yourself. Yeah. Anyway, the other major player for Dragonlance is Margaret Weiss, who was working as an editor at TSR in their book line. Mm. Now, when I say book line, the history of Dungeons & Dragons books at this point was pretty much non-existent. Right. So what there was, uh, there was one science fiction author who'd been invited to go play a game of D&D with Gary Gygax, and then she went home and wrote fanfic about her characters going to Greyhawk, and then published it independently, and that's the first Dungeons & Dragons Uh, novel. uh, And it's not even actually, like, it is, is, but it isn't. It's, yeah. yeah. Who was that? That is Andre Norton. Andre's a pen name, I can't remember what her actual name is. Okay. Yeah, she published as Andre or Andrew, because science fiction field is not very inviting to female writers. Oh, you don't say. Yeah. (laughs) Well, that's changed, hasn't it? (laughs) 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 Anyway, the book department, all they'd done so far was the Endless Quest books, which were a series of 
pick a path books. Ooh. So it's sort of like getting you the idea of like, this is what Dungeons and Dragons is like. Sure, sure. You are a character exploring a dungeon, but there's no stats or anything. You just do a pick a path. Ooh, basic. And yeah, I used to have some of them back in the day, and they were, they were fun. Was... And so Margaret Weiss was the editor on the line, and she I think she'd written one of them herself. Uh, anyway, so they hired an author. I don't remember who the author is, but they hired this author to write the Dragonlance novels, and she was responsible for editing his work, and she went, I'm really not inspired by what he's doing. This is just, he's not good. This is not what we want. And Tracy Hickman read the stuff too, and went, this guy's just getting it wrong. So he did it himself. They teamed up. Oh, Oh, which is why they're still the pair. Yeah. So, yeah, Margaret Weiss, the editor, and Tracy Hickman went, you know what, we could do a better job ourselves. Nice. And they did. Yeah, yeah. So what they wound up doing, because nobody really knew what to do for this sort of thing. This is the first real official Dungeons & Dragons novel, is they took the first playtest session and they Mm. basically just wrote the whole thing up. Cool. Including all the, like, specific antics, all the ticks that some of the players Oh, that's why there are so many characters. Yep. Because there were, like, what, eight? There are eight characters. Damn. Back in the day, you used to have large parties. Man, people had lots of friends, apparently. Yeah, but they had things like um, the magic user in the adventure gets described as being sickly, and so the player who got him was like, oh, well, how am I going to play this? And then he spoke with a whisper. <coughs> and, he, yeah, and he had this sort of really commanding, quiet presence. And the writers went, oh, I like that. We're using that. Um, so, yeah, this character, his name was Raistlin. Uh, and all it was meant to be was Wasted Man, because he was really weak, with his big, strong brother, Caring Man, Caramon. Yeah, their antics wound up getting made official. Um... I think even the fact that they played Caramon as this dumb guy who used to like making shadow puppets winds up getting into the novels and it will break your heart when you get to the shadow puppets. It's actually really good. Anyway, so yeah, they they novelized it. The adventures came out. They were big. The novels came out. They were huge. Mm. They were absolutely game-changingly huge. There were, by the time the line ended, almost 200 Dragonlance novels. What? And, gotta say it, I've got most of them. Damn. Because <laughs> I came across these things in primary school, and they were my gateway drug to Dungeons & Dragons. Wow. I read Lord of the Rings, and then I found Dragonlance after that, because I went on this, I will read literally anything that's fantasy binge. Mm. Oh, been We've there, all been we've there, been we've there. all been there, right? Yeah. But then, yeah, I found Dragonlance, Dragonlance hooked me in, and at the back of the book... It said, did you enjoy reading all this? Now you can play the game where you are these characters. Uh Uh-oh. And I went, you can what? And then we went on holiday to the UK. And New Zealand didn't really have game shops back in the... What's this? The 90s. Early Early 90s. 90s, I think there was one over in the city that I heard about and I got to go to once before it shut down. And it was probably more wargaming, wasn't it? Oh, they had some D&D stuff and I was wildly impressed. But my uh, pocket money just could not stretch to a $50 book back then. But we went on holiday to the UK where we found a game store and, oh, I remember we went to the bookshops and... In New Zealand, you could get, like, you know, the first couple of series. Yeah. And then we went to the bookshop in the UK, and there was an entire wall of Dragonlance and Forgotten Realms novels. And, (laughs) oh, I was in, like, Little James was in Hog Heaven. (laughs) It's pretty funny looking back at the 90s and remembering how we couldn't get stuff. It is, isn't it? Anyway, we found this box, and it was called Dragonlance, Tales of the Lance, and it was... The campaign setting. We found the Dragonlance campaign setting and it blew my mind. And then I read through it and I went, what? This isn't the game? You need more books? But we went to London after that and in London you could absolutely find those books. And so I got myself my player's handbook and my monster manual and my dice and you seen the dice you know those really really ugly orange and white speckled ones with the white numbers that you can't really read those are my original polyhedral dice wow yeah Yeah, and the numbers are so worn off over the years and that's where it all started off anyway so back to dragon arts not that we really left it the way i see it dragon arts had two 
massive impact on the role-playing scene. And I cannot stress enough how big these impacts were, both for good and for bad. Go on, what were the impacts? The first one was that this was about telling a story. Ah. And the second one was the books. Ah. So, hey, story. And this is where I'm going to turn it over to you, Claire. What? This is where you come in. Because we played through the first one and a bit, one and a half, one and a fraction, Dragonlance Adventures. So am I telling both the good and the bad, basically, oh, yeah. in the same... Pretty much. In the same breath. Okay, so James gave me character sheets. That can, this is all 5th edition. Yeah, fully, we updated it all to 5th edition. Yeah, gave me eight character sheets. Because by then we'd already run uh, games with multiple characters. And this was I was very used to running yeah. many eight, characters Eight, I think, was a bit of a stretch. But... I've been bigger since. But anyway. At eight, when you're getting to know people, is a little bit hard. Especially when seven out of the eight are male. <laughs> and so there's like one less distinguishing thing to tell the difference. I remember some of them, I was getting confused as to who they were. Yeah. So yeah. one of the things with the Dragonlance adventures is, I think this is kind of the problem. It was really cool that they had this big story that they wanted to tell with these ongoing characters and plot that tied into the character's backstory. But it was their characters the and people, their plot. The people who playtested. It was the characters that they had decided on. They said, these are the characters that you will play this game with. Oh, the, the Tracy Hickman yep, decided Yeah, they got written up in advance oh, so that, you know, in I the second adventure that. you go to the back the homeland of one of the characters uh, and the, the third adventure you go to the village where the dwarf comes from and in the sixth or seventh one you go to where the knight comes from and you know so they've all got their backstories that get used in the campaign so you know I, I actually i appreciate where he's coming from with that but i personally would prefer a co-constructivist approach where yeah you approach your players and say hey i want to tell this big epic story but i definitely need one of you to be like the chosen one and i need someone else to be like the samwise ganji the sidekick of the chosen one and i need another one to be like the mentor figure the gandalf if you so will. later on when they reprinted the adventures for third edition, they tried doing that for Dragon Lance, where they said, here are the eight characters, but what you actually need is you need one person who's going to be the religious one, and mm, you need one mm, person who's going to mm. be the wizardy one, and you can create your own characters. Mm. But it was kind of too late at that point. Yeah. So there we are in the first adventure, and you've got these eight characters. And, and I, what I do remember is that even before we were in the epic epic dungeon um, Tracy Hickman designs a good yeah, dungeon huh? yeah even before we were there you really had me in the world you had me worried about the fate of because you really situated me in the situation with Gold Moon and Riverwind mm. I was worried about the tribe I was worried about you know how we were going to live our lives in our normal traditional way and then you know, it's like you know you've got to go and save the world by doing this dungeon crawl and getting these discs that have the prophecy on them and stuff. And yeah, it's a little bit facile how Dragon Arts ties the characters into the adventure, but by the standards of the 80s, that is like light years beyond any other adventure where sure. there was literally nothing. And I still felt like, you know, yeah. the hero's journey of like the call to action, the denial of the call, because mm. I should be with my people. And then no, we actually have to like go. So, you know, yeah. I felt some classic story beats in there. And then... We completed that first episode, and oh, the dungeon was so good. And I don't usually like dungeons, but like this is a really cool dungeon. But anyway, so we finish that, and then episode two is we're in a tavern, and then there's an, an attack on the tavern, and we all get kidnapped. And there's like two hundred people attack. Yeah, so there's, nothing there's no you can way. Do. It's railroad central, and, and you then... get put in the prison wagons, and you just roll, 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 yeah. roll, and you watch all the things out the window of the prison wagons. And... Yeah, but then like, so we had to stop playing after we freed everyone, and James went, okay, so at this point in the narrative, all of these people that you just rescued, you let them go off alone while you go and do plot stuff, and I was like, no, that is not what Gold Moon does. Gold Moon takes care of people. She's going to make sure they get back to safety. So, like, 
our plots completely diverged because like if Goldmoon was going to rally everyone and make sure they were safe, but like they didn't know where to go either. Basically we were going to be like traveling around with an army who were going to be like more <laughs> and more like intensely believing in Goldmoon and her cause and stuff. Now, spoilers but- <laughs> for the next adventure. At the end of number two, you were meant to get that army and no, number three right, is right. about being the leaders of that army. Right. But uh, we, I decided we were going to run the original adventures as they as were as, written. Yeah. And so the whole way through I was thinking, why didn't I just like, throw out the railroad because you meet an npc who says hey we need to go to the land of the elves and yeah. then, and then you get captured and taken to the land of the elves yeah. and it would have been so easy to say hey we need to go to the land of the elves and then have all of you go okay and just go there whereas the way that it happened i, re- I vaguely remember that our encounter with the elves was like weirdly hostile of yeah. like why should we listen they to you? rescue you and then they're like we are elves and better than you so and we were like okay bye yeah we're not gonna do what you want now <laughs> no, because... yeah no <laughs> yeah we've got and... you and whose army <laughs> like <laughs> these guys <laughs> and we were both just feeling the pain from running that horrific cutscene. it was so railroady and yeah and so that's the thing like the adventures follow along with the plot of the books. Well, actually, that... it's actually the other way around. Wow, the right, The books right. got... Well, it, it, originally, the adventures got written first, and then the books got written to sort of novelise the adventures. But nevertheless, but the then... adventures got written as if they were books. You know what I yeah. mean? Like it's oh, not, very much so. It's not sandboxy. There's no actual choice. So with that one, I think they... That adventure actually becomes cool sort of like three quarters of the way through <laughs> when they finally go, here is a dungeon that you must infiltrate and you must rescue all the prisoners in it. Right. But you can't go around like fighting everyone because then you'll raise the alarm and they'll lock the whole place down. And if you escape, then they'll kill all the hostages that they've still got. And so you've got to be a little bit careful about it and a little bit sneaky. And that's cool. See but now, there could have the been... author had no idea how to get from the first adventure to that point and just wrote this horrific railroad to make it happen. And that's a continual theme across the Dragonlance adventures. There could have been a good opportunity in 5th edition to update the, that campaign. I still think they could do, actually. Well, are they going to now that they've had the fallout with Hickman and Weiss? No, no. Well... There were rumours that they were going to update yeah. it for 5th edition. We'll see what happens. Anyway, they updated the adventures a couple of times. They updated them again. They re-released them in 2nd edition. And then they re-released them again for Saga, which we actually like. It's flawed, but we like it. Saga is cool. And in that one, they actually rewrote the adventures and had things like, what if the elves tell you, we need you to go do the suicide mission of rescuing all the prisoners? And you say, no thanks, we'll go with the refugees. So that's actually oh. there, and it gives you much more options to sort of jump on and jump off the plot. But it has sidebars about what to do if you want to exactly follow the path of the novels, which is slightly depressing. And then in third edition, they went back and just reprinted the adventures, but updated the stats. Yeah, modern game design has moved on. Sure, but the real impact... Yes, the Dragonlance adventures have some horrible, horrible railroading in them. And some horrible NPC theatre. And um, there's another one. The fifth adventure starts off with Box Tech saying, You left the city where you were, went to another city, then dragons attacked and your party got split into two and now you're these people. And the other half of the people are no longer here. Which, oh boy, that's the worst railroad of all. Wow. And it's in one Box text. I mean, at least it gets it out of the way fast. It just... Wipes but out half the party. And absolutely, absolutely no, no control or agency. Damn. But the real problem is it completely changed the way that Dungeons and Dragons and role playing games worked from then on. Because from that point on, people wanted to tell stories. They wanted to explore characters. And like personally, I think we're very much in the tell story, explore characters side of things. Absolutely. But so wait, what did people do before that? Uh, We, a bunch of anonymous hobos, enter a dungeon and see how many monsters we can murder and how many traps we can bypass and can we get XP from killing monsters and finding treasure. So it's like just the start of Order of the Stick then. Yeah, exactly. And Dragonlance shook everything up by saying, maybe you don't really care about the the gold maybe you don't care about killing the monsters maybe your goal is save the world so yeah it 
it seems like it brought it way more in line with fantasy fiction. Absolutely. And I think that's a great thing. Mm. But mm. at the same time, that focus on you're telling my story, yeah. not the emergent story of what the players come up with. It lends itself to um, railroading. But this is the growing it, pains. And so this it is the um, growing pains meant the that form. there were a whole lot of... For, I'd say all of second edition was fundamentally shaped by Dragonlance. All the rest of first edition and all of second edition of D and D was we are going to tell big epic stories in which the players wind up often getting sidelined so that they can participate in or observe cool things happen and meet the cool NPCs. I, th- I think it's yeah. like it's, it's growing pains. And in retrospect, I think it is growing pains, and I think things like. Odyssey of the Dragon Lords, I think, is a wonderful example of how you can tell a big epic story and put the characters as your players want to have them front and centre. But I think Dragonlance, yeah, led the opened up this whole new vista of what you could do with role playing games, but then led people down the wrong path for years sure. afterwards. Sure. And I know a lot of grognards look at Dragonlance as like this is where it all went wrong. What does grognard mean? I'm not sure what the exact sort of thing is for that what the linguistic derivation is i want to look it up but it's like old school gamers crusty old schoolers someone who enjoys playing older war games or role-playing games or older versions of such games when newer ones are available well there you go dragon arts was the end of an era the beginning of a new age for better or worse and i think also dragon lance led to the arrival of the meta plot in role-playing mm, games. Mm. The idea of there should be this ongoing story that you participate in. Villains with uh, motivations. But also plans. villains with motivations who might not be around next week. And so we'll talk about this more when we get to, say, Dark Sun somewhere down the line. But that was a game world where they had their story that they wanted to tell. And so you got the core box set and it described all these cool characters. And then a couple of years later they were all dead and the world was unrecognisable to what's in the box. So I have a question for you. Yeah. Besides the nostalgia of it and like the fact that you found it at this very formative time of your life and that... These are pretty big things to be oh, saying, apart from yeah. apart from being the f- one of the foundational texts for my love of fantasy. Yeah. Apart from that, what is it you like about Dragonlance? Apart from all just the nostalgia and that you feel like a kid again when you think about it. Oh no, really? You don't have an answer. <laughs> That's actually quite a hard one, because it really is the nostalgia. Okay. 